Today, I'm talking with Thomas Wright, famous for his insight into the listing presentation. He talks to real estate agents about reconsidering our approach, how to effectively and successfully present to sellers and win and keep every listing. Thomas is president and principal broker of Summit Sotheby's International Realty in Salt Lake City, Utah. Thanks for listening to the Jerry Metcalf podcast, where top real estate agents tell how they do it. This podcast is to share knowledge for realtors and raise awareness for Give Back Homes, where real estate professionals work together for social good. Jet Centers Aviation, Bentley Atlanta, Legends Global, thank you for your sponsorship. All right, everybody, we've got Thomas Wright with us today. He is the president and principal broker of Summit Sotheby's International Realty. And he has grown the company since he joined in 2008 from $135 million to this year it will be almost $2 billion. Thomas, it's so good to have you. To fill, tell us a little bit more about yourself and fill in the blanks on, on who you are. Well, I love real estate, everything related to it. So I feel so lucky to be involved in this industry. And I feel even luckier to be associated with the Sotheby's International Realty brand and know people like you, Jerry, and be able to network and and share best practices and do podcasts like this. So it's very flattering to be a part of it. I, uh, like you said, got involved in the Sotheby's International Realty brand after being a top selling agent at, you know, various other brands. And uh, since then, I've just been growing this company here in Utah. We're based in Park City, Utah, but we cover the southern part of the state down near Zion National Park in a city called St. George, Utah, as well as the Wasatch Front, which is the Salt Lake City metro area. So we're really covering the whole state of Utah. And it's just been such a remarkable experience to watch this brand take hold with consumers and with other top producing agents and uh, recruit them, get them to come over and watch this steady growth from $135 million in sales, as you mentioned, to now mm-hmm. close to $2 billion. An annual sell. It's just been fantastic. That's incredible. And I'm excited to have you here today because what I want to, I'd love to dig in deep with you is not only have you been a successful real estate agent in your career, but you oversee agents and the difference between those that succeed and don't succeed and tapping into that and really into the listing appointment or what many call the listing presentation. And you know, all of the beliefs about how it's, how everybody thinks it's done and what it is and what it really is and how to be successful at it. So um, starting on that, tell, uh, tell us, you know, in general, as we go into this, what, what do you see, what would you say is the biggest difference between an agent that's mediocre and an agent that's just rocking it? Because, you know, we've got 5% of the people doing 95% of the business. What do you think the difference is between those 5% and the rest? The biggest difference I see is confidence. Uh, confidence is a calling card in our business. Clients want to see the confidence of a productive and proactive salesperson. And it can't really be faked anymore. I think there was a time in our industry where you could, with your great personality or just brute force personality, take over a situation or a client with a great personality and get business. The business has become now very technical. Uh, you have to have technical skills. You have to be good at presentation. You have to be good at negotiation. You have to be good at pricing properties. You have to understand how to put a marketing plan together. Uh, you have to you have to know a lot of different technical things. And you can't be confident as a real estate agent or broker if you're not prepared and you're not good at those things. So the confidence that wins is the kind of confidence that's not faked or one that's um, manufactured. It's one that's earned through pre- preparation. And I believe when agents prepare and they're good at pre- presentation and they're good at pricing and they're good at negotiating and they're good at their technical aspects in their business, mm-hmm. that they win. And unfortunately, most agents just aren't ready, willing, or able to do that. And so it's an enormous opportunity right now that exists for agents, no matter how long they've been in the business, to rise to the top by being more prepared than their competitors. Oh, exactly. Preparation. Opportunity comes to those who are prepared. I think there's a quote, something like that. It's so true. You just see see it. I see agents that have been in the market or in the business for 10, 20, 30 plus years, and they're still just going out and winging it, basically. They don't really manage the SOI. They don't have their contacts in a CRM. 
They don't reach out to their clients. They mm-hmm. just kind of wait for the phone to ring. And when it rings, they just go out and kind of do what they've always done. Mm-hmm. And that's just not working well for people across the country. They Consumers want more than that. Well, especially in a business as competitive as ours. I think in Atlanta, there's about 17,000 agents. And I'm not sure that many houses even sell a year. So it's incredibly competitive. You got to be you got to be good at what you do, and you got to know your market. Um, you and I we've we've met at the um, the global networking events over the few over the years through Sotheby's, and the memorable one for everyone, especially people listening to this podcast, would be in Las Vegas. You did a class and more than filled a room that held a few hundred people. People were in the hallway trying to break and climb over one another to get in the door to hear it. It was so good about the listing presentation because it's, it, those that list at last. So I want to, I'm going to let you take a lot of control here because it's your, it's your class and your information. Um, but go into that and tell us kind of what is your advice on this and in, in, in getting and winning these listings and being prepared and all of these things that make agents, you know, the 5% more successful than the rest. Well, I, it does go back to the pre, uh, you know, the presentation skills and the preparation mm-hmm. and everything that we do to get ready for it. But I think what resonated with um, everyone in the room, I think why it was so wildly popular with people was it didn't treat the listing presentation as a 45 minute or one hour event. My philosophy on the listing presentation is that you have to extend the presentation when you have as much to tell people as we do representing the Sotheby's International Realty brand. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, your pre-listing presentation, what you do the minute they call or reach out to you, how much information you can get in their hands before you arrive. Exactly. And then what you do when you arrive, uh, how, how you approach things. Because if you're just winging it, the, the, the things that you don't want to talk about up front, because the client won't hear the explanations on price and marketability and positioning and advertising costs come out first. And if those things come out first, you're at a big disadvantage because then the consumer is just going to pick the person who's telling them what they want to hear. And that isn't always the truth. And so so what you do there, how you approach the presentation, the words you use, uh, the way you carry yourself, what you take with you. I mean, we really got down into the details of that. And then what you do after. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of listing agents get the deal signed. And the, the number one complaint I hear from consumers is I don't hear from my agent enough. They don't communicate with me. They signed a listing and then took off and I never heard from them again. Or I'm not hearing from them enough. I don't know what's going on. I'm not getting mm-hmm. feedback. So we talked extensively about what you do when you leave the listing appointment and you're successful and what a contact management plan is for a listing so that you can continue to educate them on what you're doing. And you can, in, a, in, a, in an offensive way, instead of a defensive way, be proactive about showing them everything that we're doing. Because we do so much for our clients. Exactly. And they just don't know they just enough don't know. about it. Well, there's so much you said in that. For example, on the front end, in our business, we're trained to lead generate, lead generate, lead generate. And call people, call people, call people. And then we get the business and everybody's happy because the sign's in the yard and we've got the listing. Um, but that's not where the money comes. It's great to have our son in yard and great to have listings. And, and one of my favorite, well, there's a few. When you get that first call, the listing, the interview begins. First of all, it's two ways. And the interview begins when you get the phone call. And even before, usually they've hired you before they pick up the phone. But when they pick up the phone, you've got to make sure you don't lose the business. And one of my favorite things you said was there's this whole common thing I've, I've even seen it I don't remember where about being 15 minutes early to a listing appointment and I love it you were mm-hmm. like that's just rude <laughs> don't be 15 minutes early be on time um but going from that you know I know we've got you you're on the call you're on the call tell us a little bit about walk us through the steps on that first call when we when you get that call for the listing appointment give us some advice you have on the conversation how it goes most people get on they get the appointment and they're off what would you say about that Well, yeah, because they're trained to just get the appointment. And they think Mm -hmm. by getting the appointment they've won, a great real estate broker will set the appointment and then create expectations for what's going to happen when that appointment arrives. And what I talked about in the class was a simple way to do it if it's an hour presentation. And of course, every property is different. Some require more time and some require less. But a good formula is just breaking it into three thirds. And So if you have an hour presentation telling them, hey, the first 20 minutes I'm there, I would like to tour the property and have you tell me everything about it. 
tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like. And while you're doing that, I'm going to make a list of everything that needs to be done in order to get the property on there, photographed and on the market. And I'm going to categorize all my comments into A, B, and C. The A's are the things that have to be done in order for us to take photos. The B's are things that I hope will be done because I think they'll provide a return on investment for you by making your home more showable. And C's, which are pie in the sky. If you can get to those, that would be great, but we're not going to count on them. And mm-hmm. so now that, that's a perfect example of what we're going to do the first 20 minutes. Now they're like, okay, I get it. He's coming. He's assertive. He knows what he's doing. I'm going to get something out of it. And, and then, you know, the second 20 minutes, we're going to talk about me, my philosophy, my qualifications, my references, the, the brand I represent, what that means, why that's important to you, and everything related to marketing. And then the last 20 minutes, we're going to talk about pricing and marketability, absorption rate. Uh, positioning your home in the market, reviewing the the competition, and and then you know we're gonna we're gonna bring it to a closure. So when you arrive at the appointment now, instead of when you knock on the door just saying hey how you doing, just kind of wandering around with them, which makes people very uncomfortable. By mm-hmm. the way, you're saying okay I'm here. I've already told you what we're gonna do. Let's spend the first 20 minutes touring the property. I want you to tell me everything you can. I'm ready to take notes. I'm gonna start making my list. People respond really well to predictability and consistency. But I've been on so many listing presentations with agents, and most of them are good at what they do, and I don't want to be critical of them, but I think it's fair to say that many of them are winging it, and they're just kind Absolutely. of doing whatever comes to mind, and they're in some really bad habits, and so it just doesn't work well for them. Well, and it, it, we all know, have been in any number of listing presentations, they, the first thing they want to talk about, like you said, is the price. And it's an emo- you're talking about somebody's home. It's very emotional. You're talking about home and money. Home and money are two of the most emotional things in our lives. And it's it's hard for even, and the more objective they are, the more emotional. I, the more objective they claim to be, the more emotional I find they are. Because people use mm-hmm. objectivity and analysis to justify their emotional decisions. And the point in that is that you get in that appointment and they're going to make their decision emotionally, whether they want to admit it to themselves or not. And they got to feel good. So this is a, it's a great way to make them feel good about what they're doing. Cause I know they're going to get to the price, but now they're actually excited to tell you about their house and they're excited about to listen to you. You're setting expectations. So that's great. Right. And now if they do ask you, Hey, what do you think it's worth? You can say, remember that's going to be for the last 20 minutes. And I, I prefer the two step approach to coming back and talking about value. I don't know how we as uh, real estate brokers can go to someone's home sight unseen usually and come prepared with everything we need to educate them on the value of their home. I mean, we've got to see it and then go back and do some research and be more thorough about how we're approaching it. And, and, and if we don't encourage them to allow us to do that, we're actually encouraging them then to listen to the person who inflates the price the highest. And, You're exactly and I right. guess sometimes that works out, but but it doesn't work all the time. And that's the most detrimental thing a seller can do is inflate their price because, you, Jerry, you and I know that when they do that, they end up taking price revisions. And when you take price revisions and you add days on the market, you end up with less. We end up with less. You end up with buyers who ask what's wrong with it. And, you know, the biggest challenge, and you can elaborate on this better than I do, but is that a big thing I have is sellers say, why doesn't somebody just make an offer? They don't make an offer for two reasons. Number one, because they haven't seen it. And number two, because they're comparing other properties in the same price point. And if they're not making an offer, something's looking better. So what you've got, and in, in, if somebody does just make an offer, it means they're a low baller and they're not attached to the result. And that's not the buyer that's going to give you the most money for the property. So... Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's 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 such a science, and mm-hmm. I don't think we do a very good job of telling them that. I, I also think one thing you can add to that when you're talking about positioning a property in the market is, you know, I've got to put a presentation together for you to justify to you where you need to be. And that's the same presentation that I want to use when buyers inquire about how negotiable you are or why we chose a list price. Because mm-hmm. if I just pull it out of thin air and try to convince you of it, that's all I'm going to do when a buyer comes and asks. And therefore, you shouldn't hire me. I want to be more thorough than that. So when a buyer's agent calls me and asks me how we priced it, I can share a very comprehensive presentation because the buyer's agent's also not very prepared and not sharing a lot of good data with their buyers. And so then what buyers do is they, they figure less is better. So I'll just negotiate as much as I can. And one buyer might think getting a million dollar property uh, for nine, you know, offering nine hundred thousand 
is a more aggressive way to buy than just offering a million dollars for a property that's worth one one that might be underpriced. Mm -hmm. So they're trained to think that negotiating is the key. No, negotiating isn't always the key. The key is finding a property with the best value and making a play on it so that you can have some upside later on. And, and have a sense we, of we can't yeah. do that when we're not thoroughly evaluating properties. Well, having that sense of urgency from the buyer that somebody else is going to get it. They'll, I, somebody will. Everybody wants what everybody wants, and nobody wants what nobody wants. People will pay you to keep somebody else from getting it because they want it. But if you're not worried about somebody else getting it, and nobody else wants it, first of all, what's wrong with it? And secondly, there's the incentive to negotiate. And I think, what would you, what's your advice on um, when when sellers say? What, you know, sellers say, well, we've got to have room to negotiate, which which I wouldn't, I think that all varies in price point and market and property. But in general, in Atlanta, the difference between when a house goes under contract, the difference between the final list price and the sale price is on average 2%. And depending on the market, anywhere between one and two properties per 10 goes under contract for asking or better. Now, as the price point changes, that adjusts, adjusts a little bit, maybe up to 5%, but not as much as you might think. So I, I give you all of that just to give my perspective on, on this market in Atlanta. But when a seller comes in and says to you, what, what, is, what, is, what is your success and have you seen so many real estate agents be successful in, in helping them understand that there comes a point that too much room to negotiate is pushing you out of the market? How do you yeah, communicate? I kind of just I, did it. Like but, tell, yeah. Yeah. I like to tell sellers there's three kinds of buyers. There's the new and waiting buyer, the ones that are sitting there waiting for new inventory to come on the market. Those are the best buyers. They're the most emotional. They'll pay the most and they're the most motivated. And they're usually the easiest to work with. Mm -hmm. that, the second is the dealer. The dealer comes in and wants to wheel and deal. And, you know, they usually show up about, you know, 180 days after the property's been on the market. They start wheeling and dealing and they, you know, and they're, they're, they're just in a lot of ways a nuisance to sellers because sellers don't want to wheel and deal their most important asset away. And then exactly. the third type of buyer are the bottom feeders. And the bottom feeders are the ones that come in a little bit later and they just lowball and to steal properties basically. And it's fine. It's a fair business practice to try to flip them or do whatever they want to do with them to, to make a profit. And mm -hmm. so what I tell people is if you, when they say, well, I want to build a cushion in and have some room for negotiation, what they're doing is they're catering their per, their price to the number two buyer, the dealer. Mm -hmm. And that isn't who you want to deal with. No. You want the new and waiting buyer. The new and waiting buyer doesn't deal. When they see something they like, they, they buy it. For it. Before somebody else gets it. They pay it. for it. And so I would tell people, if you price the property to attract dealers, then you will attract dealers. But what we're trying to do is get you to attract the new and waiting buyers that are going to jump when they see your property hit the market at, and, and it's priced at a fair, you know, a fair value. Exactly. Exactly. That's brilliant. It's taking it, flipping it. It's not, you know, it's easy for us to see everything from our perspective. But the whole point is the buyer's writing the check. We've got to put this, we've got to think about this from the buyer's perspective and get this in front of the buyer. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, Jerry, That's it's like, it's like you know, if, if somebody goes online to buy a treadmill on, you know, some classified ad and, and, and a new treadmill is 1500 and they see it priced on the site for 12 or 1300 the first thing they're going to do is lowball the person selling it mm -hmm. because they, they're not going to pay $300 less or $200 less for a used treadmill when they can buy one that's new. If you price the treadmill at 900 now all of a sudden somebody's saying, well, you know what? That's pretty fair. I'm saving 600 bucks. And, you know, I don't yeah, know. Great so, analogy. You know, and so, yeah. So, you know, you just have to look at the psychology of it. If what sellers want to do is attract the dealers, then they will attract them by the way they price the property. And we don't want number twos and number threes. We want the number ones because they pay more, they're more emotional, and they're way more emotional. So this leads me to quite, to um, think about these properties that it, it's kind of too late and, and You've got these these sellers who go on and they've overpriced and now they realize they're overpriced and they're going to have to lower their price. And we need to we need to price it at market and oftentimes a little bit lower because of that time we've had on the market. Is there any insight or is it kind of like on at that point you're like, hey, hindsight's 2020? Or is there, in, you know, especially when you, there's these expired listings that we, the sellers now coming to us to take over the listing? 
Um, we can make it a little newer, but what's your advice on that, that you tell sellers or, or that you've seen the most successful agents um, deliver to these people? Well, I think the most successful agents don't wait a long time to mm-hmm. revisit the question of market value. Mm-hmm. They, they're disciplined and systematic about reaching out. Some, some do it every three weeks, some every four, some every five. But the point is they're reaching out in a systematic way to reevaluate the activity, the feedback, and what's going on in the market. I don't think price revisions, when you're, in, when you're under the average days on the market, really hurt you that much. I still, th- I, think you can, I still think you can do well if you're quick about reacting to the way the market reacts to your property. The problem, exactly. though, is most agents wait too long. They wait too long to reassess the value, mostly because they're scared of having that conversation or they know it will be difficult and, and uncomfortable. And they get past the average days on the market. Once you're past the average days on the market, now you're really chasing the market down. And so I don't, I don't mind sellers that want to test a higher price point, but that have committed that if it doesn't work quickly or we don't, we're not seeing signs that it's, it's attracting the right people, we'll mm-hmm. adjust quickly and find fair market value. So I think you, know, you, you can be aggressive. You just have to be smart about the way you're being aggressive. Exactly. You, you can get away with it, but you just can't wait. Time is the enemy when you've got a property on the market. Exactly. And do you have any insights on the house has been on the market, it expired, the seller said, okay, now I'm going to interview new agents and hire a new agent. And you're the new agent that's being hired. Um, is what, what's, what do you think is the advice you give the seller at that point? It's been on the market. It's past market time. It hasn't sold. It's gone off. And now they're ready to try again. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times it isn't just price. I think sometimes if we get in the game of encouraging a seller that has already had a listing agent and already been on the market, that the only problem is price. I think it's a mm-hmm. real turnoff to mm-hmm. the seller, and I don't think it's 100% accurate. Price obviously plays a role, and it has to be evaluated. But exactly. I think it's back to the three things that I talked about earlier in the listing presentation. Number one is let's go through the home. What are the pros? What are the cons? And what needs to be done to make it more attractive? Number two, what, what's my philosophy? What are my qualifications? What marketing can I provide? What platform do I represent? And how am I exposing your property to find the best buyer? And then number three, which is what you asked about, is where are we on price and, and, and what is the market absorption rate? Where are we on supply and demand? What is the competition? I think you have to go back and you have to start at the beginning, and that is evaluating those three very important things in unison. And I think the mistake most brokers make is they only go straight to price. And it's such a turnoff because good advertising and good promotion and solid exposure for a property makes a dramatic difference in the ability to get it sold. It absolutely and does. And so does, so, so does staging or showability or correcting some of the deficiencies that maybe some buyers are turned off by. So I think you have to go back. And, and I can't believe it, how many times, Jerry, I go in second with you know one of my brokers and they've already had it listed with somebody else. And I'll ask them, okay, well, how many showings have you had you know, with the other agent? Well, I don't know. Maybe like 10. I don't know. Well, okay, what was the feedback you got from those? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, don't know. She, she called me once and she told me, I think she said that they, but I don't know. I never really heard. And, I, and that, that so to true. me is just absolutely tragic. It's such a breakdown. And it's what causes our industry to be you know, looked upon less than it should be. And mm-hmm. we've got to be better with our clients than that collectively and individually. And we all have to make a commitment to make that happen. That's so true. Well, it goes back to everybody says price is everything, but price isn't everything. Price is a no, huge component of it, of it, but it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. I love exactly. It's one third of it. It's not everything. So, yeah. well, what is the biggest thing that you want the listeners to take away from this interview about listing and the listing presentation? And even what's your additional advice on being a good agent in, in, in general and in this market? Well, I think the big takeaway is preparation. I, I said in my class, if you were there, uh, mm-hmm. which everybody kind of got a kick out of, I can walk around my offices and I can tell when somebody's getting ready for a listing presentation, they're frantically grabbing this magazine or that and, they're stuffing, you know, pages from the printer in their bag and grabbing this newspaper ad and just they're just frantic. And mm-hmm. they just have this look in their eye like they're unprepared and they're trying to throw it together. So I'm a big believer in preparation and knowing what 
to, you know, how to attack the presentation and what's going to be most valuable for that specific client and that specific geography. And, and, I, and so I think the big takeaway here is if you want to be a great listing agent, the opportunity is enormous because mm-hmm. most listing agents are relying on past relationships mm-hmm. and they're relying on their personality. And those are two things that you can overcome with somebody and you can beat somebody. If you can exactly. go in and show a better way, they will, they will go away and say, hey, you know what? They're my friend, but you know what? I think it's in my best interest to hire you. And, you know, the person that's just relying on personality, you can beat them. So to all the agents out there that have been doing this a long time, the takeaway is get back to the fundamentals and the basics and get back to that preparation that made you great. Don't get sloppy and complacent and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And to the new agent, I think the takeaway is the opportunity is enormous. If you want to pay the price and you want to get prepared, you can win. And you can win at all price points. It doesn't matter uh, where you are or what area of the country you're in. You can win. You're exactly right. And it's so funny because I was doing the big takeaway, but I, but that takeaway led me to another question before we, before we finish. In, in preparation, there's, there's, a, there's a few parts of the listing presentation. There's the phone call. There's the few days before you go to the listing appointment. There's the listing appointment. And then there's the after the listing appointment. Do you have any recommendations on here are the three things that you need to make sure they have physically in their hand before that listing appointment, during that listing appointment, and after that listing appointment? Or- yeah, I mean, I think, yes, the answer to that is I believe that there are fundamentals that just have to be covered. For example, photography. doesn't matter where you live or what price point you're competing in or what market you're competing in. Price point, all right, photography matters to everyone. And that, that includes getting the home ready, the shooting of the photography, what the turnaround time will be, who's editing them, what order they go in, where they will be syndicated. I mean, that is a topic that I will cover at a you know $200,000 condo to a $25 million luxury home in Deer Valley. I will cover that with everyone in between because that is something that should matter to every single consumer. So knowing what those things are to you and making sure that you cover those points well, I, I think is vital to winning. Wow, that's great. And then... Yeah. Yeah. And I think, do you, I think that would be something you take the time to cover when you get to the listing appointment in the listing appointment face to face with the client before you even talk about oh, price. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to show that. I mean, showing how photography drives good print advertising, showing how photography really now, I, the way I say it is I say the first showing now is online. You know, your first showing isn't when they show up. They've seen the home now you know, at least once, maybe more. So having the photographs in the right order and, and um, and making sure that the home is an accurate depiction uh, of what it is mm-hmm. online, it's it's so powerful. I mean, I I still marvel at some of the photography that our industry is willing to provide. They're doing it on their own iPhones. You can see them in reflections in the oh. mirror. Toilet seats are up. Garbage cans are out. Shampoo bottles so tipped funny. over. I mean, it just it just they, absolutely blows me away that that's okay for them or their clients. They, and so you, you, you know, yeah, it, it's, and it's still going on. It's so funny you say that because everybody and it, we do we just we are in a competitive industry because everybody's a real estate agent it seems like, but then again when so many real estate agents are doing business like that it's like take who's your how much competition is there really, how much competition is right? there really? That's my point is if you're preparing yeah. you'll win because there's so many opportunities to exactly the way that things are being done. Exactly, oh that's that's awesome that's great and then you know on that note is what. Give us a story, just one story before we do close this out on something you've experienced and where you, where, how did you go from, and do you have a story or something that happened that went from, we all get in this and we don't, not everybody has this insight that you've just shared with us. I mean, it's very rare to hack, to come into a company and get this kind of insight. It's pretty much non-existent. So, you know, you went from new agent, didn't know what you're doing to now, You've got a full course that you're you're teaching and speaking, and you're coming to Atlanta to talk about what was the transition of that, and what was the story that kind of bring, brought this together and made it happen. Well, I, I think for me, the inspiration was I, when I was selling. I suddenly I was in a good flow. I had a good book of business. I had a I had business that I could handle, and mm-hmm. then suddenly when I built systems, and I wasn't thinking about what. I was doing all the time. I was just letting it happen. 
like good feedback to my sellers. I didn't have to worry about it because I had built a business system where it was just going to happen as long as I was working hard because I didn't have to remember the, the checklist. I have one in place. What happened is my business went from flow to overflow. And that's what happened in running this Summit Sotheby's International Realty. We had a good business, started $135 million, and we were kind of chugging along. And suddenly what we were doing resonated with so many people Mm -hmm. that we had to create systems in order to make it sustainable to be able to help everybody who wanted access to to them. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized our industry could dramatically improve. And I thought, hey, you know, I have a passion for uh, helping other people and sharing what I know. And so I offered to share with a few people and suddenly I became a speaker and people want me to come and tell them how I've done it. and, And it's very flattering. But I, I would love to see our industry step its game up. I think we could do a lot better collectively, and I would like to see that happen because I think our consumers deserve it. And this industry has given me a lot, so I feel like mm-hmm. I know and I want to give back. I love it. I, I think that's great, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think Sotheby's, the platform of Sotheby's, is definitely a place where we're held to a better standard, and we're we're doing that. We've got people like you helping us do that. Yeah. Well, you're nice. I agree. It's a oh, fantastic it's brand. We're, <laughs> it's a gift. We're all lucky to be a part of it. It really is. Well, let us know this as we as we do close out on this. What what are you excited about moving forward? And um, make sure you give us your contact information. Well, I'm excited because this industry is shifting. It's changing dramatically every day. And mm-hmm. I'm very encouraged about that. I want to be a part of it. And I wake up every day with that chip on my shoulder knowing that if I get comfortable or I get complacent, uh, or I get too cozy in what I think and how I act. Mm-hmm. That somebody will be, come in and do it better than I will. And I'm just not willing to let that happen. And so I, I wake up every day thinking, hey, this industry is changing. It's becoming more technical. It's becoming more competitive. What can I do to have an edge and to stay ahead? You're and exactly right. It, it, just, it couldn't be a better time for that because it is very competitive. But there's a tremendous opportunity for those that prepare and those that do a good job to grow their businesses dramatically in every market all across the country. So I'm just really excited to be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the future brings. You know, and you may, and when you say that, it's not just, to, I think it's good to not be so worried about the competition, because as we already said, it's not necessarily as much as we think it is. But just thinking about yourself and how am I going to, how am I going to, quote, put myself out of business. That's a big, I don't know if you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, but that's a big quote he has. But putting yourself, looking at what you're doing, and if I were competing with myself, what would I do to win? And just making sure you're making that improvement, even if it's just a little bit every day in your business. And that's exactly what you're talking about. I think the important, yeah, I think the important thing too is is to realize that really the competition is only with yourself. If you're the very best version of yourself when you go, then you can live with the win and you can live with the loss. If you do the very best job you can do, if it mm-hmm. doesn't work out, then you can live with it. It's when we don't prepare, we're not the best we can be, that we yeah, have regrets right about that. short and long term. And I just don't want to look back and say, hey, you know, I could have done it better. or I should have done it better. or I could have serviced my clients better. I want to look back and say, I did the very best job that I could do with what I was given. And I'm proud of that. And we should all be motivated by that because one day it will all be over. We'll have to retire or we'll have to move on. And we don't want to look back with regret thinking that we could have been better. Let's make it happen now so we don't have to have any regrets. You know, there's the book, Good to Great. And it talks about it's just as easy to be good as it is to be great. Actually, it's easier to be great because when you do things right, the results are exponentially better and the process is exponentially easier from doing things like the systems you talked about. So. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't have said it better, Jerry. I agree. Well, great. Well, thank you again so much, Thomas, for having us. And bef- and do before we go, give us your phone number and website or the best way to reach you. Oh, well, you can reach me anytime uh, on my email, which is thomas.wright, like the Wright Brothers, W-R-I-G-H-T, at com, Or I guess you could call my office at 435-649-1884. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks, Jerry. It's been great to be with you. Congratulations on all your success and thanks for including me in it. And same for you. Thanks so much. 